to us. Well, I think I can. <laughs> and I guess if I think I can enough, with your help. <coughs> You know, when I started working on this sermon three or four weeks ago, I was on my way to church. I was listening to a gospel music station, and the music, some of the numbers inspired me. And I started looking at material to support that music. And I was just pleased and amazed at how many texts there are just like the text that you read for us, Alan, telling us that we can aspire to be with Jesus. And we can make it. We don't have to just think we can. But we, it starts there, doesn't it? I have another text, Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance. I think I can. Perseverance. The race marked out for us. You know, in certain years, this time of year, the television coverage is filled with something that supports my sermon topic this morning. It's a race of a kind. It's called the Olympics. The Winter Olympics, doesn't it come at about this time of year sometimes? And I was reading about some of the Olympics in the past and the trials and the tribulations that the athletes go through. I particularly like figure skating. So dramatic, so beautiful and fluid. And in the time that I was recovering, recalling, and I read about this fella called, oh, what, Evan Leitch. Now, maybe I said his name wrong, but from now on he's just left. Evan. Okay? Evan. And his troubles in fact, he wasn't the only one. Many of the male skaters were falling, slipping, making bad turns. It looked like they shouldn't have even been at the Olympics they were doing so poorly. Evan, through perseverance, in spite of all of that, won the silver medal. But it didn't start with that. He was skating so poorly in his short performance, he missed a jump, and then he missed another one, and then he fell. It seemed like he was wasting his time even being there. And then he came back for the long performance. Only he had spent the three days in between with a stomach flu. Anybody been sick recently? Oh, it's a terrible thing, isn't it? I spent about three days with fevers here a couple of weeks ago. I'm still suffering, and I can imagine what Evan was going through with this stomach flu. And they were giving him intravenous fluids to make up for all that he was losing in his body. And he visualized in his mind what he needed to do. He took those fluids. He said, I think I can. <clears throat> and on the day of his short program, he went out and performed. He put everything he had in his body into that performance. He put everything he had in his mind into that performance. And he won a medal. He got the silver medal, first, third place. Evan persevered. 
He finished the race. He met me. Life is sometimes like Evan's experience at the Olympics. You slip. You fall. Sometimes you face difficulties. Yet, what can you do? Give up. After all, that seems like the prudent thing to do most of the time. Why do you want to embarrass yourself by keep trying at something you're failing? Just give up. However, I don't want to give up. I want to be like Evan. I want to persevere. I want to finish the race. I want to finish the event. I want to win the prize. Evan's prize was a silver medal. I am not satisfied with a silver medal. You and I, we can stand not on an Olympic platform, a podium. We can stand right next to Jesus Christ. And that's no consolation prize. If you want to think of it, heaven is filled with streets of metal. Gold. A winner's medal. Paul said it this way about his life in 1 Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Or as Alan read for us, but one thing I do from Philippians, forgetting what is behind. You know, if Evan had dwelt on his falls and his failures and his illness, he would not have finished getting that silver medal. Forgetting what is behind. Straining towards what is ahead. You know, if you're going to be into the race, it's not going to be something casually you do. You're going to have to put every effort into it straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God has offered me. How can we be like Evan? How can we be like Paul? Overcoming difficulties. Press on to finish the race. A race that we can be proud that we ran. Well, chapter 11 of Hebrews talks about faith, doesn't it? All of the end starts out with a large number of people who finished their life well. They didn't give up on the race. Race problems that were often their own failures. They went for the gold and they finished well. People like Abel, he worshiped the Lord until his life was taken. Enoch walked with God. Isaiah, Jacob. Noah, he was obedient to God. Perhaps it seems like he was the only obedient person to God in his time. And he tried to warn others about what it took to be obedient to God. You know, I can imagine that Noah met many days of discouragement. How often can you tell somebody what is the right thing to do and they laugh at you and you keep right on doing it? You're going to get discouraged? I think Noah must have gotten discouraged. I think that often he was in a valley of despair. What am I going to do, Lord? And you know what? I think he stayed home once in a while from going to go build the ark. You think he went out and worked on it every day? I think sometimes discouragement overcame him. He's just like me, I'm sure. Abraham. He followed God to the point of going someplace else to live. Don't hold him up too high. He did finish the race, but he had a lot of problems. Where did those problems come from? Well, I'm telling you that most of them were his own doing. Things that he knew better. 
But you know what? No matter how bad his problems were, he worked with God. He allowed God to pick him up, dust him off, and put him on the road again to where he was supposed to go. Dusted him off. You and I need a little dusting off once in a while. Actually, you know what? Since, my, since I left home and my mother and father no longer dust me off, I think maybe I still need a little dusting off once in a while. Joseph. Our pastor preached about Joseph several times recently. He overcame the rejection of his brothers, his family. You know, one of the biggest things he overcame that I read was that he overcame the, the, the image he had of himself. He seemed like he was quite taken with himself. And he overcame that. A high opinion can really bring you down. We learn, he learned from his lessons of despair, false accusations, and being a slave. It took all of that for God to dust him off and get him ready to be a leader. You know, all of the saints mentioned in Hebrews 11, suffered many falls. They went into many valleys of discouragement and despair, yet they were finishers of their race in spite of all of the obstacles. They persevered. They picked themselves up. They tightened their boots, and they proceeded on to win with God. Did you hear those last two words? Did you pick up on it? They didn't win by themselves. They won with God. God was walking right beside them, or they had never made it. The message that I got from Hebrews 11 is that the key for these people to finish the race of life well is to go for the gold in faith. Philippians 3 tells us to run the race of life and do it with faith. To trust in the Lord. How can you do that? How do you run a race using faith when you don't have any? Or what you've got is a small amount. Or maybe you just don't understand what faith is. How it seems like an oxymoron to me, moron to me, to say, run the race of life with faith when you don't have it to start with. As I started putting this together, I thought started thinking of ways that I think you can increase that faith. Only, I'm going to try and remember not to call it faith. I call it trust. I trust the Savior. That's what I mean when I say faith. Is I trust Him. As I was putting this together, I looked at some stuff I haven't given you yet, but looked at it and I said, Boy, this is really jumbled all up. I don't have it very much in order of any kind. So I made myself a little outline. And here's, the, here's my outline, just in case you think I'm a little jumbled up too. The first thing to work on that trust with God is fellowship. The second thing I have is to be prepared. You can't run a race unless you practice. The third thing I have is I wrote it down and I scratched it out. Prayer. It's another one of those things that just, ah, uh, it's too easy to say. Really, what I'm really going to be talking about is talking with your friend. Talk with Jesus. And then align your expectations with reality. And then endure. Endure. You can call it anything you want. It's putting one foot in front of the other. 
we can develop the faith to go for the gold through fellowship. It already read to you out of Hebrews 12, 11. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. People who have already ran the race. If you were going to go for a, an Olympic event, or maybe you just want to do a marathon, would you go out for that marathon without ever talking to anybody who has gone out for the marathon? You think you know all about it already? Here in Hebrews chapter 11 are a group of people who've already done it. They've ran the race. We can also learn from each other. I remember the names of many people in my life that have finished the race with Jesus running by their side. And I know they had Jesus because I can look at each one of them just like I can look at you. And I can see their lives reflect that they had someone helping them out. You think life's easy for people? It's not. I thought of people who in my lifetime have fought the fight climbed the mountain, who went through many years of I think I can. I think of my wonderful friend George, paralyzed from the chest down for 35 years before he passed away. You think he didn't climb mountains in that wheelchair? I think of Clarence. Clarence was orphaned by the time he was 12. He lived out in the swamps of Florida off of whatever he could glean out of the vegetation and the wild pigs. And he became a Seventh-day Adventist and he told his roommate, he says, we've got two pounds of bacon and I'm going to eat that before I get baptized. <laughs> Clarence told me he never got sicker in his whole life. <laughs> I could tell you about his marriage problems, about his children problems. I could tell you about a lot of things. But I just want you to know, Clarence had many uphill battles. I witnessed a number of them. And he still speaks to me, even though he's been passed away for a number of years. These people have set examples for us to follow. Some of you are examples for me. Some of you keep telling me, I can finish the race. The struggles of those in the past and your struggles inspire me. You keep telling me I can do it. You keep telling me, Robert, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And I'm believing you occasionally. That is why in the scripture it tells us to encourage, build up one another in the Lord. Restore one another as we see a brother or sister whose trust is not as strong as it might be. We do not know. Unfortunately, I don't know how to change that, but I don't know what your struggles are. I see you at church and you're all dressed well and you're smiling. What happened last week? You're too embarrassed to tell me. Or maybe you don't trust me not to tell everybody else. But we do have struggles to share. And it really is good for me when I can see that you come to me and put your arm around me and say, you're my brother. Amen. I, I, I really think that I can do that. I read about a ragged woman who was sitting on a sidewalk in front of Starbucks on the cement, not a chair. 
And ragged meant that she had a lot of holes in her clothes. And she didn't buy them that way either. It appeared to all who took the time to notice that this woman was losing the battle. The battle for, for self-worth. Maybe even life itself. She had a soup can that she had gleaned from behind the row of businesses. She also held a small cardboard sign. The sign had a message that has burned in me ever since I read the story. Please help me. Each day is a struggle. Brothers and sisters, I can't finish this race without you. <coughs> if you're not helping me, the struggle will take me. The next thing you need in this struggle is to be prepared. We can learn to trust God by being prepared. The scripture says, let us throw off everything that hinders us from running the race. Hebrews 12. 1. Throw off everything that gets in your way. I read that the U.S. bobsled team has special, special clothing, special equipment to help them win. The runners on their sleds are made out of a special aluminum that sharpens itself as it goes across the ice. I don't know how that happens, but I believe it. When it comes to winning, professional athletes don't let anything get in the way. When I watched the Olympics last time around, one of the favorite things after the skaters was the snowboarders. They seem to be filled with themselves. They want you to know how good they are. And they are. You know, they even have special outfits, uniforms they all wear and strut around. And these big, thick parkas to keep them from the cold. But you know what? When they go out to perform on those snowboards, you don't see anybody wearing a parka. It would get in the way. That's too much hindrance. You want to win the race. If they have to go out there in tights, they would do it. Throw off everything that gets in the way of winning life's race. What are the, some of the things that hinder you and I from winning life's race with God? From going for the goal of heaven? Well, any goals that you have other than living up to the purposes God has for you, are a hindrance. Have you ever thought that you might have some good goals that are hindering you from going to heaven? Uh, good goals! I hesitate to mention the ones that came into my mind. But you know, just because you get so involved in doing good things, you may not be spending time with the Savior. Perseverance, finish life well, faithfully, is what God's calling us to do. And it doesn't mean we won't face problems or obstacles, temptations, but we need to keep the faith to continue trusting our Savior. I have personally found that one of the hardest things for me to do in the midst of a trial is to pray. I might find it difficult. We find it difficult to pray because maybe we blame God for what's happening. Or maybe it's difficult to pray because we think this is so unfair. God, you should have already intervened and taken care of me. After all, I go to church every Sabbath. We 
we should have emotions that get in our way as well. And they can be an obstacle to prayer. Prayer can be hard during a trial. Actually, I don't like the idea that people tell you. And there's a little motto that I see from time to time. It says, prayer changes things. What changes things for me? I prefer to have a little talk with Jesus. You know the song, don't you? Have a little talk. Well, I won't try. <laughs> but he's my friend. My confidant. Would you, any of you, be surprised if I told you all my secret sins? I hope you would be surprised by my secret sins, at least. But we don't trust each other, do we? In fact, we have a confidant that we can trust. Someone who's willing to be right by your side no matter how terrible and filthy you've been. His name is Jesus. Just have a little talk with Jesus. And you'll have the strength to get up and try again. During all of our trials of any kind, drawing near to my closest friend enables me to persevere. You know what? I need to talk with him. This might surprise you. I need to yell at him. I need to laugh with him. We need to share our pain, our joy, and our struggles with him. We need to share our hearts with God so that he can begin to align our hearts with his. The results of talking with Jesus is he helps us endure the trials of every kind that we face. When you have a little talk with Jesus, do you know it will get better? Well, I'm going to tell you something. I know it won't get better. Did you hear me? I said it'll get better, and then I said, no, it won't. It won't get better. The reality of our lives is that we live in a fallen, broken, messed up, hostile world. where sin abounds and sin wins every day. Except in your life. There is a thief that comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. There is a sickness that comes to hurt and kill. There is selfishness that comes to wreck, isolate, and demean. There is a disaster that comes to destroy, to stress, unbalance you. This means that we should come to expect that this life will be filled with pain and frustration. No one's life is perfect. I don't care what they post on Facebook. No one's life is perfect. I don't care what you tell me how great things are. I know the reality of my own life. And if I'm going to win the race, if I'm going to qualify for those golden streets, it's only going to happen one way. That I keep, keep trying, keep recognizing Jesus as King, will, and is by my side if I want him to be. Nothing will ever be fully right on this earth. You and I can have happiness. We are made for a relationship with Jesus. I ask myself, why did Jesus create this world? You know the answer. 
He needed a relationship with his created beings, Adam and Eve. That's why he created it, for a relationship. And he's still looking for you to have that relationship with him. I don't want you to jump to the mistaken idea, the conclusion, that if we trust in the Lord, zap, supernatural powers are now yours. Strength and disappointments can go away. I don't want to mislead you. Because it doesn't often happen that way. I want you to turn to Isaiah 40, verse 13. If I have to tell you, this is the one thing I want you to take home from the sermon today. It's Isaiah 40. I lost my note where I am here. What verse was it? 4031. Do you have it? I want to read. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. What a magnificent picture of strength that Isaiah has painted for us. An eagle, a magnificent, marvelous bird. When you want to think of something with great power, when you want to think of something with great beauty, the eagle can come to mind very quickly. And it soars so high. The eagle, special gift of strength. That's the kind of experience I'm usually looking for when I pray to God that I want to be lifted above pettiness and disappointments. <coughs> then there's another incredible vision of God's power. On an individual suffering from weakness, they will run and not grow weary. Now we often think of little children like they're toddlers, you know. They run all the time. No child ever wants to walk anywhere. They're going to run, and they don't seem to get tired of running. Great, great, great. Oh, what, a, what an image. But when you get past 20, running seems to be a waste of time, doesn't it? I can get there. I, there's nothing that that important. I can get there just as easy walking. Exercise. Exercise, yes. <coughs> We won't diverge from the sermon. Okay. Run and not grow weary. If you can't fly like an eagle, it wouldn't be too bad to be faster than a speeding bullet. But how does God's strength usually come to you? You're in the valley. You need to get out of that valley and get to the mountaintop. How does that usually happen? The, the third part of the text. They will walk and not be faint. On the surface, it doesn't sound like such a big deal. But I'd like to think about it. I'd like for you to think about it for a moment. Do you live your life soaring in the clouds? What life is is a matter of persistent walking. Walking through the valleys. Walking with Jesus by your side. Walking. When we are faced with disappointing circumstances, we need the strength to just keep on keeping on, not give up. I read about a woman who was going through a valley of despair, very difficult times trying her. She was experiencing some major distress in her marriage. Her job was unfulfilling. 
and was causing her heart for ache. She became so distraught over the circumstances that she felt just like giving up. And some people do. She felt lonely, dejected. She felt very isolated in her life. She had tried everything she could. She spent hours in Bible study. She spent hours on her knees. And she spent hours with her pastor and friends. If only, if only she had more faith. If only she lived as a better Christian. It seemed that everything she turned to, turned out horrible. Finally, she came to the point of exhaustion and felt there was no way out of her circumstances. Her life may as well be over. There would never be any more joy. One day, she was sitting in her kitchen very frustrated, very lonely. She sat there for a long time and just wept. Then she noticed a small sparrow walking around in her kitchen. She got up and opened the door to the outside so that that sparrow could get out. The sparrow flew and flew into the window above the door. You know how some older houses, they have the door with a window above them. They call them transoms, open for ventilation. Well, that sparrow just flew right into that window. And when it did, it knocked itself out and fell to the floor. The sparrow shook itself a bit, flew up again, did not discern the open door but flew right into the window again. The sparrow fell to the floor, did not discern the open door, and flew into the window again. I've seen birds do things like that. Until the sparrow was so weak it couldn't fly anymore. It walked around the kitchen for a bit, walked towards the door, walked right out through the threshold of the door to the outside, shook itself a little bit, and flew away, freeze to me. It was as though God had opened her eyes. She could see that she was just like the sparrow. She was trying to get out of her confining situations all by herself. Every time someone would say something, she would react poorly to them, her family members. She'd be knocked down by flying into the window. Not giving her best at work, she would knock herself down. Paying back evil for evil, she flew into the window and failed again. Saying and doing things she knew were wrong, bam, into the window and failure again. Finally, you and she realized that all she had to do was walk. <clears throat> walk very humbly. Walk with Jesus by your side. Amen. Allow him to give you the strength to recover and fly again. We all have heartaches, difficulties, little slights we give each other, not intending to necessarily. But they put us in a valley, don't they? And we try to get out and climb that hill all by ourselves. I think I can. I think I can. Nothing wrong with that. But you can't do it by yourself. You've got to have Jesus by your side. 
And then you have to realize that what you can do is you can humbly walk with Jesus. And when you realize that you can humbly walk with Jesus, then days will come when you can fly faster than an eagle and run faster than a speeding bullet. <laughs>